Blog Talk Radio. What's up, everybody? My name is Clifton Pettyjohn, and you are listening to Transformation Radio, where we transform lives through purposeful conversations. Have you ever gotten to a place in life where you find yourself asking, what now? That's right, what now? Circumstances and situations have happened. You feel as if you've been hit from the left and the right. You feel as if nothing that you do ends up working out the way that you desire for it to work out. And you just don't know what you need to do right now. The reality is we've all been there. And sometimes we've been there without the tools, techniques, and strategies to help us make effective decisions to produce the future that we desire. You don't have to do this alone anymore. I invite you to listen to my podcast. That's right. My name is Clifton Pettyjohn. I'm a purpose strategist, author, transformation coach, and spiritual leader. And I host the What Now podcast. And the What Now podcast is simply conversations that teach us how to effectively face life's most difficult moments. That's right, life's most difficult moments. So if you're interested in hearing the podcast, I encourage you to visit my website, www.cliftonpettyjohn.com. Again, www.cliftonpettyjohn.com. There, there's a tab for the podcast, and you can pick your favorite platform. We're available on multiple platforms, so you can pick your favorite platform, Pick the platform, subscribe to the podcast, listen, 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 comment, 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 and share, 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 all right? So I encourage you, again, make sure that you are listening to the What Now Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Transformation Radio. That's right, where we transform lives through purposeful conversations, regardless of how uncomfortable and unpopular those conversations are. My name is Clifton Pettyjohn, and I'm excited to be with you on tonight. I have an amazing guest. We're going to get to him in a minute. However, before we get to our guest, I always like to remind us that you are welcome to call in at any time during the show. The show is open for you to call in. You can be a part of the conversation. We want you to be a part of the conversation, but I also want all callers to understand that it is okay to disagree with my guests. It's okay to dis- disagree with me. It's okay to disagree with other callers, but we're going to do it in a respectful manner. If we cannot be respectful of each other, then we're going to have to decide not to call in anymore, okay? But I believe we're all going to be respectful. Like I said, we have an amazing guest tonight. He has an awesome story, and I believe that your life's going to be transformed from hearing this man's personal story, okay? So here's the call-in number. The call-in number is 516-387-1756. Again, 516-387-1756, all right? So without further ado, let's welcome to the show Derek Gordon. Derek, how are you? Hey, what's going on? I'm doing great. How are you? 
Definitely glad to hear that. I'm doing great as well. I'm excited about this conversation, and I'm excited because, like I said, I believe people are going to be impacted from it. They're going to be encouraged from it, and I believe that they're going to even become more comfortable in being who they are as they hear your personal journey. Yeah, you know, one of the things, you know, personally for me, you know, I love inspiring people, you know, however way I can. So um, that's one of the things I live and abide by every single day. So um, I hope this conversation that we have tonight can help others who are struggling and whatever area they, they may be struggling with. And, yeah, I'm ready to get started. All right, let's go then. So I'll start with a, with a light question. I ask every guess this same question just to be a little icebreaker, okay? So the first question is, if you had one superpower, what would that superpower be and why? Uh, Probably uh, to never die, honestly. Um, Just because I'm curious to see as far as you know, how the world is going to be when it's like 2080 and 2090 and yeah. so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, just a you know, power I just can't die. Like, I'm indestructible. So, you know, I, I right, stay right. young. You know, I can pick an age at where I want to live for the rest of my life. You know, a superpower like that. So, I think I you feel, can't really beat really you when it comes to that. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, the next thing that we do before we get into the conversation is we play a quick game of word association, okay? I have about six words, I believe it is. When I say these words, I want you to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. It can be one word. It can be a sentence. You can elaborate on it however you want to do it, okay? Okay. The first word is life. Life. Uh, is that for me or in general? Like what I think about life? Just in general. What what you think about life, the first thing that comes to your mind. It's beautiful, you know, able to breathe and walk this earth every day and do what I love to do. Perfect, perfect, okay. Purpose. Change the world. Acting. I didn't hear you say it again. Acting. You said acting? Yes, acting. Oh, acting. I love it. You know, um, it's a lot better than I thought it would be. Um, you know, I love it just as much as when I was playing basketball, believe it or not. You know, I love how, you know, you can go into different characters and, you know, be somebody who you never thought you could be, you know, in acting, of course. Okay. Now, staying right there on that ro- that word real quick, how did you get into acting? Uh, so I had a manager reach out to me probably about two and a half, three years ago um, and just asked me, honestly. He reached out to me and just asked if I wanted to get involved in TVs and movies and things like that. I didn't really think anything of it, um, believe it or not, because this was just after when I had to come to grips that, you know, I wasn't going to be playing basketball anymore. Um, and when I had to come to grips with that, it was a very, it was a dark time for me. You know, I have to be honest, you know, I was, you know, I was stunned. I couldn't believe it that, you know, I was ending my career at such a young age when, you know, I kind of, you know, thought I was going to be playing basketball till you know, my mid thirties, you know? Um, but I, you know, I always watch, you know, the Oscars and Golden Globes and, you know, always fantasize of how cool it would be to be part of something so special like that. Um, and, you know, so he asked me, I didn't think anything of it, but I did a pilot in New York and this was my first time, you know, acting on camera and everything. And I fell in love with it. You know, I remember we were shooting a subway scene, um, at like three, four o'clock in the morning. And I was just so energetic and just wanted to learn more about, you know, what goes into becoming an actor and just stuff behind the scenes and, you know, the feedback that I got for the, from the producers, you know, from that pilot was they said I was a natural. They thought, you know, I've been acting, you know, my entire life. And, you know, for me, that was kind of like, you know, my calling card as to this is what I want to do for my, the rest of my life. You know, I was happy doing it. it. It brought back 
joy in my life as far as, you know, when I, that joy that I used to have when I was playing basketball. So it was like, wow, you know, I, I wasn't expecting that. Just, I said, it was more of like me just trying to see, you know, okay, let me give this a try, but then come to find out like, wow, I absolutely enjoy it. Okay. Now let's segue in. We'll finish the game a little later. But let's segue into talking about basketball because you were talking about, you know, how you came to grip with you not being able to play anymore in your career ending at such a young age. At what age did you start playing basketball? Oh, probably when I was like six, seven. Um, when my father put the basketball in my hands, of course. Um, you know, I tried a couple different sports, but you know, rest I wrestled, played baseball, football, but basketball, you know, in a way it kinda stuck out. You know, I'm the tallest in my family. Um and I was tall at such a young age. So, you know, I had a advantage over a lot of people growing up, especially in middle school. Um so yeah, I, I would say practically, you know, my whole life. But then when I just strictly played basketball, it probably started like in middle school and I didn't play any other sport because I wanted to just focus on one sport. Feel you. So when when you started playing in middle school, were you the star of the team, or were you were you like on a, a dream type team? No, I was the star of the team. Um, okay. But for middle school, it's so interesting because I was a when I was in sixth grade. Um, I don't know if they do this at every middle school now, but you know they give you know I guess the upperclassmen a chance to like play more because they're leaving. So it was more like for me, mm-hmm. I was in sixth grade. I was playing a lot, but, and I knew the coaches knew I was better than, you know, most seventh and eighth graders, but, you know, they let them, you know, play ahead of me because they were, you know, graduating and going to high school and stuff like that. So, um, but I, I'll say for me, when I started to reach my peak, as far as like, I think that, yeah, I can do something with this. It was probably my seventh grade year was when I kind of like broke out. Um, I would say on, as far as like on the national stage, I broke out and people started to, you know, really recognize me. And, um, and that's when I had to decide when it came close to, you know, when I was getting ready to graduate and go to high school, it was either, okay, I go to, you know, my local high school playing for high school or I go to a private school. Um, and I remember St. Patrick's in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, the number one high school team in the country, you know, for so many years. And, you know, I when I watched them play, I was like, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to play at. Um, and what's funny is that, you know, I went, up, I went in there and I, I had such a big head because, you know, people were telling me I was this and I was that. My freshman right. year, they tried to put me on JV instead of varsity my freshman year. I didn't, they, oh, wow. that caught me off guard. So I'm like, are you serious? So I tried to transfer. Like, literally, the season didn't even start yet, and I was already looking to transfer. And, uh, and I was going to go back to, you know, playing for high school. And literally, it, this is how I know it wasn't meant to be. My mom took my transcripts to playing for high school. And the computers weren't working that day for some reason. So wow. I wasn't able to get put into the system. Literally the next day, you know, because I, I, I slept on it. I said, all right, yeah, maybe it's not meant to be. And the next day I decided to say, you know what, I'm going to just stay at St. Pat's. And then, of course, the next day the computers were working. So I was like, ah, yeah. That that was, um, you know, I'm, I'm always a firm believer in, you know, things happen for a reason. And it just wasn't meant for me to, you know, be going there. So. I feel you. I feel you. Now, how was private school versus public school? Was there a big difference there? Was there a big adjustment for you? Or did you kind of just ease right into it? Um, I mean, only the only adjustment I would say is two things. Of course, you got to wear a uniform, you know, so it's more like, yeah, dress pants, shoes, um, the St. Patrick's sweater. Um, they had a long sleeve, shirt sleeve, um, a button-up shirt, um, tie. Like, oh, they, you had to go all out, and, you know, you'll get, like, fines, you know, if you didn't, like, have a tie or something like that. It, it was crazy. It was you know, I wasn't used to that at all. So, right. but and 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 that particular high school was probably only a total of like 120 students total. So, oh, wow. going from you know 
you know, hundreds and hundreds of kids in the school to narrowing it down to, yeah, only 120 students is just like the school wasn't that big. It, it really wasn't that big whatsoever. And you'll be amazed just looking at the school and you'll be like, wow, like this school has the number one high school basketball team in the country. It was, it was crazy because a lot of people that were going there, the school was in Elizabeth at the time, Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, mm-hmm. It's not there anymore. They moved somewhere else. But everybody who went there, they weren't from Elizabeth. They were from somewhere else, you know, and you had a lot of people who went there who wasn't even from New Jersey. So yeah, it was definitely a school oh, wow. that, yeah, it was a school that a lot of people wanted to go into and you had to pay. So I had to go through that whole process of getting somebody to pay for my scholarship and all of this stuff. It was, yeah. And it was just very, very sweet. Um, this family, um, gosh, I, I should remember their name, but it was so long ago, but, um, you know, they were very sweet and they paid for my tuition all four years. So. Oh, that's what's up. That was a blessing. Yeah. yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. So when in high school did you realize that going to, the playing Division One basketball was an option, or is that something you knew straight in middle school, or is it something that developed later in high school? Um, I would say probably my eighth grade year. Um, there was this uh, this game that they held every year, and it was called New York versus New Jersey. So the best players from New Jersey play against the best players from New York. Um, and that was a breakout game for me. Um, you know, everybody was talking about me even more. And, you know, and I remember sitting there talking with my father and, you know, talking to him and telling him that I think I have a chance, you know, if, you know, but I, I the only way, you know, I want to go play, you know, go to the best school I possibly can, because I, I didn't feel like playing for high school, my local school was going to get me to that point as far as, like, you know, put me on that stage that I wanted to be on. You know, St. Patrick's Day was playing on ESPN and getting tons of media spotlight. And, you know, there will be times in practice there will be, like, 15 college coaches on the baseline watching our practice. Um, And I just started to notice every year, even JV, they were still, like, looking at me even though I was playing JV. So I kind of knew, like, okay, like, if they're – Watch me, and I'm playing JV and not varsity. Then yeah, that goes to show. Yeah, I definitely they they saw the potential. Um, and I still remember seeing you know coaches like Billy Donovan who was who was at Florida at the time, but he's now coaching at mm-hmm. he's coaching at Oklahoma City Thunder, and seeing mm-hmm. um, Tom Izzo who coaches at Michigan State, and just seeing all these coaches in person, and it's just like wow, like this. Like, to me, it's like every kid's dream to, like, honestly, like, sit there and, like, coaches lined up, like, watching your practice. It is incredible. It's an incredible experience. And, like, I think any athlete, regardless of sports, should experience that because it's, 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 it's truly amazing. Now, how did you handle all of that? Because that's – did you feel pressure uh, playing in front of these coaches and – or did you just zone in and play your game? Oh, I mean, of course, at the beginning, I was just like, I was nervous. Like this, you know, I'm saying mm-hmm. I was a, you know, freshman year, it wasn't that many because as I said, they weren't really coming to JV. But, you know, the mm-hmm. varsity head coach and assistant, they were talking to the recruiters about me that, oh, yeah, you know, after his freshman year, he'll be a sophomore, so he'll be playing varsity, yada, yada, yada. Um, so my sophomore year when I started, you know, when I moved up to varsity and I remember I was, that's when I was competing against, you know, upperclassmen. So I was playing against Dexter Strickland, who was like the top 10 player in his class. And, you know, he was going to the university of North Carolina at the time. Me and him was going at it every practice. Um, oh. and you know, that, that, I think that kind of brought the competitiveness out me even more. Because, you know, he was a trash talker as well. You know, we both were. <laughs> and for some reason, the exactly. college coaches, they liked it because they, you know, just com- competitive. And, you know, because when you look at it, you know, we're getting each other better. You know, that, that's right. that's really what it's all about, you know. So, um, but the first couple times I was nervous. Just because it's like you want to, like, 
you want to, you know, you don't want to make a mistake. You want to, you know, give your absolute best. You know, you want to make every shot. You want to, you know, steal the ball as much as you want to do everything right. So, but what I came to learn is that you just got to play. You can't, you know, and that's one of the things that, you know, if I could rewind time, like I, I wish mentally I was better. I wish I was better because there were times where, you know, I would worry about, you know, oh, damn, I missed this shot. Oh, what are they going to think, this and that? Like, so I would say, like, yeah, like, mentally, I could have been a lot stronger than I was back then. But um, but I'm not saying that it affected my play, but, you know, I would worry too much about what people are going to think if I don't, you know, perform every game, which, you know, you got to understand, you know, there there will be games where, you know, you don't play well, you know, and, and I right. didn't take that well, you know, like, especially losing. I didn't take losing well. You know, I don't care if it was, you know, a regular pickup game and practice. I wanted to win at everything. Um, and I think that's what made me who I am today. You know, I was just very competitive. I just, I hated losing. You know, I had to be, I had to win at all costs. So, um, but as I look back, it was just, I said, I'm just very grateful and very fortunate to, like I said, be in that position, uh, have, you know, schools, you know, calling me. I still remember Virginia. I, I I was on my way home after school, and I remember the assistant coach called me and said, where are you? And I said, I'm leaving. He was like, oh, by the way, the Virginia Tech coach is here to see you, the head coach, and it's like, to see me? Like, wow. Like, that, when they were telling me stuff like that, like, it was just like, why? It's, it's like, and I'm only in 10th grade, you know? So it's it's it was just incredible. It was like, wow, like, I – like it would be amazing. Like it's it's like you know we could rewind time and do things all over again. I would go through that whole process all over again from freshman year to senior year, all over again. I would do things a little differently as far as taking my five official visits because any time you know when you're a senior, you get five official visits that you could take to you know the schools that's looking at you. I yeah. cut that off, so I ended up committing to a school when I was the end of my sophomore year going into my junior year. Um, so I didn't like, I didn't do, I didn't go along with the process as far as like, you know, being patient. And, you know, that's one of the things that I somewhat regret is I don't really have regrets in my life, but that I would say, I wish it's not a regret. I just wish I would have been more patient and not rush, you know, cause you know, when you go on any visit, college coaches are going to treat you like king. They're going to roll out the red carpet oh, absolutely. for you. You know, absolutely. so, and when I went on my first visit, uh, which was to Western Kentucky University, I was, I immediately jumped on it. I was just like, oh my gosh, like the arena is amazing. The locker room is amazing. The campus. And I'm like, when I was thinking about it, I'm like, I'm about to be in Kentucky. Uh, <laughs> which to me, it was like, yeah. Jersey boy, Kentucky, like, yeah. Right, but I will say I, I I had a blast there when I was there. I, I did have a blast, but if I had to, if I had one thing, one regret, yeah, it was just to be more patient, and that's when that honestly I became more, you know, moving forward in my life from 28 now. I was, I'm much more patient than I was, you know, years and years and years ago. So, so yeah, I don't really have that many regrets like that. I feel you. So now let's go back um, because you were talking about, you know, all of these, this, the great part of everything that happened in high school um, with you. Like, it sounds like a dream to a lot of people, but I want you to give the backdrop to as, if we can talk a little bit about you growing up as a kid, because I always like people to realize that the people I invite on the show it's possible for it to happen to those that are listening as well. Sometimes those that are, that are listening feel as if, you know, that will never happen to them because of where they live at, you know, their economic oh, yeah, yeah. status, other things like that. So what was it like growing up for you? One of the, one of the things I always tell people, and it's like, and I, I'm going to get into it, I always tell people, like, regardless of where you are in life, you can always come out on top. Like, yes. I, when people try to play that card as far as, you know, my situation and, listen, like, where I grew up at, 
I just just say it was very it was gang heavy, heavily over there, um, you know, blood, bloods, crips, and all of that stuff. Like I could have easily easily taken that route just because I grew up in that, you know. But that's not what I wanted for my life. So we all have decisions, you know. We all we we all can make that right decision to not do those things. We all have a choice. Um, mm-hmm. So for me. Um, I I stayed away from that. And that's one of the reasons why, honestly, why I didn't want to go to the plant for high school. It's because of that. Like I didn't want. Like I knew that environment wasn't good for me. Like I'm, you know, it, it just wasn't good for me. Now, don't get me wrong. If I would, if I wasn't able to go there, by all means, I, even though the environment was bad, I still would have made sure, like, okay, like I know what's right and what's wrong and what I should and shouldn't be doing. Um. But it's all about who you who you hang around with, you know, what you, you know, mentally, you know, for me now, like, I'm a huge believer in, you know, the law of attraction and, you know, you know, the, just the power of the mind and, you know, just, you know, the people, you know, surround yourself around good, positive people. And, you know, I start, I realized that, you know, a lot of things happened to me in my past was, for one, because of the people I used to hang around with and how I think. And, you know, you'll be amazed of, you know, once you change up your circle as far as like if you don't have you don't have people in your circle that are pushing you or wanting the best for you, vice versa, then to be honest with you, I don't and that's just me personally, I, I cut a lot of people out of my life just because I felt like they were almost bringing me down. Um But yeah, I'm that's how I say I'm I ain't gonna sit up here and say Plainfield is like, you know, Chicago one of those places where, I mean, but just as I said, I mean, I think every place, every city has its own, like, little neighborhood that's, you know, you a bad neighborhood where you shouldn't be hanging out at, but um, I got involved in that a little bit, um, just as I said, until, like, I had a, a huge wake-up call that, you know, changed my life forever, but um, we'll, we'll get into that, but, yeah, it's, like, regardless of where you're from, like, yeah, and I, and I can also bring up, yeah, like, and I'm sure people who are, you know, struggling with their sexuality, they could say, yeah, you know, we're looking where I live at and things like that, and I understand that. I totally do, but I knew for a fact for me, like, I wasn't going to let other people control my happiness, because that's almost in a way, like, letting someone, right. basically, right. somebody telling you, like, listen, like, they're not telling you, but in a way they are, like, yeah, don't come out, because we're not going to. We are, we're not gonna mess with you anymore. That's basically it's almost like yeah, that you you letting people control your life. I'm 28 exactly. years old. Excuse my language. Excuse my language, but I'll be damned. I will let anybody on this earth tell me how I should be living, who I should be dating, who I should be talking to. I don't know. Like I'm mm-hmm. like yeah. it's first of all, it's 2020, and the fact right, that right. we still have. Conversations like this, it's, it baffles me so much that, like, why is this even a conversation still? Like, I mean, when I came out, I mean, this, it still feels like it was yesterday, but it's like, you would think that, you know, probably another big time athlete would have came out professionally on this, and it's just like, nope. Like, it's, nope. If people are coming out, they're coming out after they're done playing. Absolutely. Right? I, mean, I think me and, me and Jason and, and, me, Jason Collins, and uh, Michael yeah. Sam. Yeah. There were a couple mm-hmm. people who were the only players who came out and were still actively playing almost. You know, absolutely. but there have been a ton of people. Huh? I said absolutely. Yeah, so it's just, I mean, don't let, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's easy for me to say this now as far as just because of, you know, I came out and everything, but don't, don't, Use as a, as an excuse, like okay, where I'm from, like yeah, like it's not possible or this and that. Because hey, listen, like I, I just you know was talking to somebody on Instagram, and, uh, you know, sent me a direct message, and I told him he said, yeah, I'm thinking about telling my parents, and I said, listen, if you're not a hundred percent comfortable, meaning regardless of how they act, whether it's positive or negative, you're still going to be happy, you're still going to be fine, then don't do it. Because I had to tell myself that regardless of what, what my parents may feel or say, as long as I'm happy, I don't care. 
Right. Like, only reason why I look at it is like I'm telling my parents off the fact of out of respect because they're my parents. That's the only reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're not like in that state of have that state of mind that yeah, like I don't care what anybody's gonna say or feel, then you're not ready. You know, which is fine. It's it's, it's okay to not you know, be ready to come out. But that's why I never force people to come out. I always tell people, right. I, I can give you all the advice in the world, but I will never force you or tell you, yeah, you should come out this time, you should come out that time. Because everybody's journey as far as that is different. You know, it took me, Absolutely. when I came to realize that, I, you know, this is who I was, it took me three years. You know, after the fact, I knew that, yeah, this is who I was, you know. So it's like, yeah, it just... It takes time for everyone. But I did what I wasn't gonna let happen. I wasn't gonna be thirty, forty, fifty years old and then yeah, no, I wasn't that's one of the things I told myself I will not do. Be that old and then all of a sudden come out now. I wasn't doing that. There's so many people who who are in that position, especially that end up with kids, then they feel even more like Right. Oh, yeah, they go even right. more deep into the closet, like, oh, yeah, there's no way this is possible now. I got kids now, and this and that, and, yeah. I feel bad. It's just, it just sucks, man, because I said, I know a lot of people who are, you know, bisexual, a lot of people, um, and, you know, it's it baffles me, because it's like, yeah, like, I'll, they tell me I want to tell my wife, but I think it's too late in the game, and it's, it's never too late. Like is I don't right. I don't care how right. old you are you fifty sixty it is never too late like I had a girlfriend at the time when I came out we were still together oh, wow. she found out and I apologized to her because I said listen I couldn't tell you at the time because if I would have told you before it would have came out publicly you probably would have tried to out me this and that so I that was a risk that I took like if you want to be mad at me for that then be mad at me for that but I I couldn't tell her. She found out when it came out on ESPN about my story. I didn't even tell her. She just happened wow. to see it on the news wow. and boom. Yeah, so she, I mean, she has all the right to, but, I mean, that's another mm-hmm. thing when you look at it. In a way, it's like you got a lot of these guys out here who are, in a way, you're using these females to hide who you really that's are, which is, in a way, you're messing their life up, too. You know, so, yeah. and that's why, that's why I felt bad, because it was like, in a way, yeah, I'm messing you know, I'm messing her life up, you know, so, but like I said, I mean, everybody, you know, situation and story is different. People may not want to come out, especially in sports, because they don't want to, you know, get, uh, they don't want to get let go and this and that. And it's, I didn't care about any of that. Like I was like, of course, if I would have stayed mm-hmm. in the closet, a hundred percent, I'll be in the NBA a hundred percent. But I believe that I didn't, but I looked at it as, you know what? <laughs> My happiness is more important. I'm not going to be here, right. you know, having a girlfriend and, oh, yeah, this girl, that girl. And really, that's not what I want just because of the NBA. Right. Is gonna, no. If that's how they feel, they can have that. They can keep it. Like, I don't want I don't want to be part of that, period. So, yeah. And then you can come out of any situation. I mean, of course, surround yourself around the pop, right people. And one thing I always tell people, because for me, I didn't really have anybody to talk to. Um Mm-hmm. I remember all the times I'm talking to my mom on the phone in college, and, you know, she would always ask me, how is everything doing? And I would always tell her, um, everything is fine, which I was lying in a way, you know. And I felt so right. bad because I could tell my mom anything, but I couldn't tell her that. So mm-hmm. I would say you just have to find that one person. Like I always tell people, I mean, I try to reach out get and get back to as many people as I can. But the best way to reach me honestly is through my my Instagram, you know. Just send me a direct message. I'm always on there like checking my direct message because just as did, just like I said earlier, there are always people, you know, sending me messages on there and asking me, you know, the steps that I took and this and that and you know, so if you wanna reach out to me the best way is just, you know, as they say, you know, slot in my DMs and then I'll you know, I'll get back to you. Yeah, I just had this conversation last night with my guest as well, and we were talking about how, you know, with our stories, how we didn't have anybody to talk to, so we make sure now that we let everybody possible know if this is what you're going through, I am 
a resource to you because I feel like that is so important when you're making, right. you know, that life type of decision that you have somebody that you can trust, you know, that, that can help guide you along the way. Like you said, not force you to do anything, but just be there sometimes just to listen. Now I want to ask you a question about coming out since we, we went on through that. What what right. did you realize that um well did you identify as bisexual or did you identify as gay when you came out? Oh gay, bisexual. No. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I'm, here's why I'm asking. I'm asking, <laughs> and I guess I meant to ask you that. I knew that, that you, when you came out, you identified as gay. I remember, it, you know. So, but I meant when right. you first. When was it you first realized that you had attraction? To uh, men. Oh, uh, oh, that's going way back before I even came out. Actually, I mm-hmm. I knew there there was definitely something going on because for me, when I was in middle school, um, I would always like look at my male teachers, um, mm-hmm. and I just thought it was a phase, though. You know what I mean? I'm like, mm-hmm. you no, know, it wasn't just like looking at them. Like I used to like look at them. Not everyone, not every older guy. Um, yeah, I but you know, most 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 of my teachers. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> it's funny that we were talking about this, but yeah, I used to look at them and believe it or not, some coaches, um, mm-hmm. and just thought it was a phase. On the sound like, yeah, nah, there's no way. Like maybe I'm sure to eventually, you know what I mean? Like pass over and I won't be, you know, doing this anymore. But I, I had to get it out of the way, so I said, you know what? So I was at Western Kentucky. Um, this was during fall break. So fall break is in December and January, which means basically the school is out for two months. And, you know, athletes, mainly, you know, who's ever in season, they get put up in hotels because the campus is closed mm-hmm. for like two months. And I forgot what app it was. It wasn't Grindr or Scruff or anything like that. It was uh, It was something else. It was just... You know, I don't, I can't even remember the name of, but I was talking to this guy. It was from Nashville, and um, it was one night, and he was like, "Hey, like, you know, you want to get together finally?" And I'm saying to myself, I'm just like, "All right, you know what, let's do it." Because I'm like, "Okay, this is going to be the determined factor for me if, you know, if this is what I like, or yeah, maybe I'm just bob and by or whatever it may be." So. Mm-hmm. I get one of the players' cars and I drive over there. You have to understand, I'm in I'm in Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is a very, very, very small town. So I'm like, there's no way that we're meeting in the daytime. Let's just wait till nighttime. Um, I think it was probably like nine, ten o'clock at night. You have to understand. The more that I look at, look back at it, I don't know what the hell I was thinking because like this situation to me is like, what am I doing? Like this is like doesn't even sound safe. Because we were meeting at right, right. I was <laughs> All right, yeah. So I'm like, I'm sitting there driving. I don't even know who this. I mean, he showed me pictures of himself, but I don't know who this guy is. Mm-hmm. Like nothing um, about him, whatever. So we get there. We're in the motel room, um, and I'm just like, my legs are just like shake. I'm so nervous. I keep like looking over my head. You know, before I get into the hotel room, looking over my shoulder to see if, you know, somebody's going to, you know, say Derek or something like that. And, you know, we go in the room, and I'm sitting on the edge of the bed. And he, I guess he wanted, we wanted to use the bathroom. He comes out the bathroom. I'm still on, still on the edge of the bed and just, like, you know, playing with my fingers. And, uh, you know, he, like, in a way, like, he pulls me back onto the bed to, like, lay back. And, you know, one of the things that I would take away from that, and I was funny, I was telling a friend this story earlier, is the kissing part. Everything else I didn't enjoy. I didn't at all. Like, I wasn't, like, you know, when you get to talking, you know, when he, he said, I remember he talking about, like, top, bottom, versatile, versatile bottom. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what is that? Like, I don't, I didn't know anything about, I didn't know nothing, nothing about that. Energy. So... I'm like, yeah, I don't know, yeah. So long story short, let's just say he got off, but I didn't. That's how uncomfortable I was. But mm-hmm. the one part I did enjoy that I will say, I did enjoy the kissing part. The kissing mm-hmm. part I definitely enjoyed. I took that away, and I was like, 
Yeah, that's a lot better than kissing a girl, believe it or not. Like, I, yeah, so much better. Like, um, and then I was, I was like, yeah, maybe I'm bi. Um, and then I started to notice that my the, my sexual drive for girls started to decrease, like mm-hmm. dramatically. Like, I went from, yeah, I had a girlfriend at the time, so you know, practically, you know, having sex with her once every few nights, and that started to decrease, and the kissing part started to decrease, and the smell of a girl, you know, her perfume and all started, like, it's just, like, almost like everything just was down, and I'm just like, what is going on right now? <laughs> what is going on? So, um, I had to have a second encounter. Um, just to like, okay, like this, this should tell it all. Like if this is starting to go downhill from there. So I ended up, you know, this was when I got back to Jersey. Um, and I, this was the time I was on Grinder. I got on Grinder when I was in New Jersey and, um, and still to say, I, I mean, as I'm telling this, I can't believe I did this. Cause most of the time, you know, I had to drive to see these people. I couldn't have them over, you know, I'm living with my parents, you know, right. so. There were times I was driving like 30, 40 minutes to see these people. Don't know who they are, what they're about at nighttime, sometimes 9, 10 o'clock at night. Um, and, yeah, that was it. When, that, when The second time it happened, I was like, wow, like, I'm really young. This is, this is me. Like, like, and I came to terms with it. I said, you know what, like, this is me. But then what I started to think more is like, how am I going to go about it now? Like, right. my parents don't know. My brothers don't know. I mean, my twin brother was incarcerated at the time. But, you know, my older brother, he didn't know. And, you know, I and I was, you know, the people who I was hanging around with wasn't, you know, good people who I should have been hanging around with at the time. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Like, I don't, like, I, first thing I told myself, I can't come out. Like, I just can't. Like, mm-hmm. um, so I say, yeah, probably when it first started for me, it was back in 20, I came out 2014, it was back in 2011 when I started to, okay. yeah, when it really started to increase more, I would say. So let's talk about the ESPN <laughs> interview. You know, the, the interview that went around the world. How was it after the interview? Like the the um, initial? Did your team? Did you talk to your coaches then before you made the official announcement, or did everybody find out on ESPN? Uh, so how I went about, how I went about it is I had a uh, you know I got in touch with Jason Collins because I remember when he came out. Um, mm-hmm. It was like a lift off my shoulders. It was like, oh, my gosh, there is other people out there who's playing sports and, you know, who's the same way as me. And, you know, so I got in touch with him, and then he got in touch. Then I got in touch with Wade Davis, who, you know, he was an NFL player who came out. And there was a project mm-hmm. called You Can Play Project. Um, and there, you know, people consist, you know, people like Billy Bean, who, you know, played in the MLB and, uh, Kirk Walker, you know, who was a woman's softball coach over at UCLA, and a good handful amount of people. And, you know, I didn't know exactly, you know, when I wanted to come out. It was just more of just talking to them to, um, to like, get an idea as far as, like, if this is a good idea or not. Um, and I remember, you know, they said that, you know, this is a risk, you know, this is a potential risk, you know, this could affect your career. Um, and I said, you know what, let me think about it. Um, and then it took me probably like a, you know, it took me a couple weeks or so. Cause you know, at the time my teammates ended up finding out, I, I didn't mention that. My teammates ended up finding out I was at a gay club in New Jersey and I get a call, I'm dancing and I get a call from one of my teammates and I'm like, why is my teammate calling me? And I pick up, and he's like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm out. And he was like, what club are you at? I was like, Club Paradise, which is, you know, a gay club in New Jersey. All I heard was laughing in the background, and the phone went dead. And 
I was just like, oh, my gosh. Like, so what they must have done, they must have did research as far as gay clubs in New Jersey and came upon, you know, Club Paradise. And I was just like, wow. Like, did I, did I, my life is over, right? So they were teasing me. So in a way, they kind of, like, forced me even more because, you know, it was constant teasing and heckling and, you know, and I, I'm, you know, I forgive them for what they did, but, you know, not yeah. just them, but people have to understand that, you know, people have feelings, you know, and, you know, for such a sensitive thing to make fun of somebody and you think that's funny, it's, it's not funny at all. Like, it's like, I could have, like, I could have did something bad, meaning whether it's, you know, no telling what, but it's like, you know what I mean? Like, when you put somebody in that state of mind that, you know, you're constantly teasing them and making them feel like crap, that puts people in a position that, yeah, they want to do some crazy stuff. So it's like, right. <clears throat> I, 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 and that's why one of the things I hate to this day, I hate bullies. You know, I usually don't use the word hate, but I, you know, I, 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 I was bullied. So I ended up talking to my coaches, and, you know, and that's when you can play project. They came up to the school, met with my coaches. I came out to my teammates um, before the ESPN stuff, you know. Um, they were all in the locker room, and then, you know, I went in there. I told them first. I went to New Jersey, and then that's when I told my parents. And then the next day, um, man, it came on TV um, April 12th. I'm not mistaken. April 11th or April 12th, 2014, when I came out. April 12th, yeah, April 12th, when I came out. So I told everybody. So it wasn't a surprise. Like they knew everything. Like they were, they was there when you know, because the 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 video that was on ESPN that was uh, that was pre-recorded already the day before. Right. Um, um, they just had it. So it wasn't like that was live the whole time. All that stuff was just pre-recorded. So got you, but. Yeah, so how, it was, how was it? How was your, How did your family react? Uh, it took my father some time, believe it or not. Which you know, I you got to go in. One of the things I always tell people: you got to go into it knowing that you know it's going to take time for some people. You can't expect them yeah. to you know accept it right away and whatever. Like no, give them time, give them space, and. You know, my mom, she, in a way, kind of already knew. Um, you know, like they say, mothers always know. Uh, my twin know. brother was incarcerated at the time, um, so I had to call him. So when he had called one day, then that's when, you know, I told him, and then uh, he thought I needed counseling and all this other stuff. And um, so it took him some time. And that's the thing. Like, I told myself, like, beforehand, like, regardless of how they may feel, like, as long as I'm you know, happy and I'm fine and I don't care what they're going to think, you know, but now, you know, it's not even, it's not even a big deal. Like my father doesn't care. Like I'm, you know, I'm very close to my father, very close to my mom, extremely close to my twin brother. My older brother, Mike, who's a police officer, was a huge supporter. You know, he even asked, you know, where did I get the Be True shirt at? It was so many people asking me about that T-shirt, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, where I got it from, and you know, I had you know someone, um, a good friend of mine who works at Nike, who was able to get it for me. So, um, but yeah, it was. Um, it, it still seems like you, it, you know, time when it's flown by, but it seems like it was almost like yesterday when, you know, I came out. It doesn't feel like it was you know 2014. It really felt like it was like yesterday. But I will say this, if I could do it all over again, I will. I will come out every day if I could, you know. That's how happy I am. Like, I'm I'm proud of, you know, who I am. I'm not, like, and when people try to use the whole God thing and you're going to pay for you, it's BS. I'm, see, I'm a huge believer in God. I'm Christian. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, I don't know who's ever teaching them that is teaching them lies or whatever like that may be because people, when people say stuff like that, it's just like, really? I'm going to go to hell because I'm gay. Like, come on now. Come on, come on. But, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel good. 
Yeah, so was, when um, you came out, were you were you still at Western Kentucky or were you at UMass then? Oh no 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 no! I ended up transferring from Western Kentucky and I came out at UMass Amherst. Um, and you know, I ended up transferring there a year later, and then I finished off at uh, Seton Hall University. You know, I wanted to be close to my wanted to be closer to my family. My family can come watch me play and stuff like that. So. So now you talked about the teammates when you had the phone call at uh, when you were at the club. How did it go when you actually sat down with your team and told your team after that when you had the open conversation with them? Did the bullying continue or how was it then? Oh, uh, the bullying didn't continue. They stopped, but I mean, in general, they they didn't handle it the right way either. Like they're I'm like, you know, if you're going to be real, be real. Don't say this and that to the right. media, but then you know, behind the scenes, you know, you're not really messing with me like that. Because most of the time in the dining hall, I really wasn't eating with some most of my teammates. I was eating with, uh, you know, my classmates, you know, and I was very close with them with my classmates, so I was always eating with them. And, um, like, I just felt like such an outsider. You know, uh, mm-hmm. or even like even after when I came out, you know, they went into the showers, like three, four of them. And as I'm coming out of the showers, no, as I'm going into the showers, they all come out. And I took that as such mm-hmm. like it's so disrespectful and slap in the face. And then I confronted them about it the next day. Um, oh, I was mm-hmm. pissed. I was, and I said, listen, like, I don't, I told you, I said, don't get it twisted. Um, I don't find any of y'all attractive. Um, even if y'all were, this is my workspace. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Like this is you know a place you know this is I can do basketball and you know in a way work like this. I wouldn't do that. So they were like shocked when I said that. But like they was like wow, like he really like confronted us about this. I was pissed. I was I was really upset. I'm like yeah, now y'all being fake. Like if y'all gonna if y'all gonna be my friends, be my friends. If y'all not, then like. Don't go to the media and say this and say that. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like, be yourself, be you. Don't say one thing to the camera and then do another thing. So, yeah, I was, I was pissed when that happened. I was pissed. I'd imagine though. I imagine that that that. I, I don't know what people think. Like the their mindset concerning that. Like when somebody comes out, it means that they want every man that they see. Like I. You, some yeah. people think too highly of themselves. <laughs> like it don't work like that. <laughs> you know? it like that's really crazy like that. though. Right, right. So yeah. now how nah, was I, it when I, you transferred the Go ahead. It, it definitely don't work like that. I don't understand why yeah. people Yeah. Um yeah. <laughs> I, I don't get that. Like, I, I never too... Yeah, and they automatically assume like you just can't control yourself around them, and it's like, what? Right, <laughs> dude, right, that, right. that never even crossed my mind. Now, and, how was and, it and, at Seton Hall? Were the teammates? Was it better there oh, it was than it was at UMass? It was, UMass? It was okay. Beautiful. It was amazing. It was probably the best. Besides my freshman year, because I would say, you know, your freshman experience is, like, one of your best experiences in college. But my senior year, oh, it was, like, me. And they were all freshmen and sophomores, so I was the only upperclassmen on the team. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm dealing with all young kids. Not one thing said as far as, like, the showering thing. They didn't care. We all hung out. We went to the movies. We did this. We did that. It wasn't even an issue. At wow. all, and that's why we won the way we did. That's why we, you know, won the Big East Championship. Big I got three rings, by the way. Yeah, I got three rings, yeah. and, you know, that's the way to finish out my college career. I'm the only player in the NCAA history to take three different teams to the NCAA tournament. The only player to do that. Yeah. There's been no one else to that's do that. And, you know, my resume speaks for itself, but it's like, yeah, Seton Hall was epic. It was, yeah. I wish I had another year. I was saying that at the end. I'm like, damn, like, if I would have just had one more year. But, 
Now, we're getting close to the end of the interview. I am going to ask you to come back to do part two because there's so much more that I do want to ask you. Um, but I want to yeah. end tonight's interview. I want to end tonight talking about um, it's the, I had this name on the game as well, the word association. I'm going to say a name. I want you to tell me, you know, what that name means to you. And that name is Kobe Bryant. Say that one more time about Kobe. Yeah, Kobe. What? What? I, I've been asking people, you know, since his passing. You play basketball. Um, I yeah. know some people, you know, that goes back between MJ, Kobe, LeBron. But how did Kobe's game, you know, affect your game, or did it affect your game? Oh, it did, a hundred percent. Um, you know, I think we all have know, moments whether we shooting a paper ball in a garbage can or whatever. Yeah, we always, yeah. always scream out Kobe and all that. Like, I've, I've had plenty of moments Early. like that, but I think what, uh, what, how he affected me was just his mentality, just his yeah. his love and passion for the game and, you know, wanting, wanting to be the best. And that's how I was, you know. I didn't care – if you were ranked higher than me in the country, like I never like cared for rankings. Like I'm like, listen, like we all human, you got to put your shoes on. Like I put on mine. Like, so I didn't care about any of that. And just his mentality to the game, it just drove me even more. Like, wow. Like that's, yeah. Like that's, that's the mentality everybody's at. Just that killer mindset that regardless of me, whoever you put in front of me, they can't stop you. So, and I had that same thing. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, I don't want to touch on it, you know, that much because I know it's a sensitive topic. But, um, yeah, nah, he – like I said, I mean, everybody handles – everybody mourns different, you know. It, yeah. Like, for instance, when my best friend, you know, passed, you know, a couple months ago, you know, I, it took me a while to get over that. You know, I'm still getting over that. Mm-hmm. You know, with Kobe, it's a – I think if I would have knew him, it would have affected – like, knew him personally, like how some people, like Shaq. Dwayne Wade, right. you know what I mean? Right. But So it was more like, right. you know, an outer, outer looking in. But I think just, you. but in a way, like, you can see that he affected so many people because people, mm-hmm. there were so many people who didn't even know him personally, and people were crying over him. Like, yeah. I mean, yes, it's sad because, you know, not even just him, the other people who were on board as well, but it's like, well, I think it was just a shock to people just because he was only 41 years old. He was just, he was young, you know, he was just, you know, living his life, not playing basketball, like just getting started, you know, so it's like, yeah, you know, it just, it just makes, I was telling my brother this the other day, it's like, it's almost like sometimes, like when stuff like this happens, it almost makes me not want to leave the house, believe it or not. I guess it's like, I know it was such a freak accident. It had nothing to do with the helicopter coming to find out. It was just super cloudy. Um, but it's almost like when stuff like this happens, and even like the situation that happened with my best friend, you know, um, who no one honestly could ever replace, like it almost makes you like, yeah, like for me, it's like, yeah, I just want to stay in the house. Like I don't want to leave the house. I'm I'm yeah. safe and secure in, in the confinement to my home. That's how I feel. Sometimes when when stuff like this happens, you know the stuff with Nipsey Hussle, that was sad too. You yeah. know, so it was like, yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, I, and that's why you know every day, you know, I, uh, I'm happy, you know, I, I live, I do everything that I enjoy every single day. You know, I'm an actor. You know, I'm, you know, I'm having the time of my life right now. My life is just getting started. You know, I've, there's so many things that are in the store that's getting ready to happen with me that. You know, I'm looking forward to, you know, my, I have a book that'll be coming out. You know, I have, you know, I have two movies that I have to film this year, both lead roles, um, which, yeah, have a potential, really high potential for me, you know, to get a possible, you know, nomination for Best Actor, which would be a huge deal for, you know, someone who's that's black cool. and gay. Um, so yeah. it's, it's a lot of things that's in the works right now. So real quick, because we're great to go off the air, like I said, I'm going to have you back because I want to finish your story. I want to talk about life after basketball, 
I even want to talk about the interview you and Darren Young did that a lot of people had a problem with. So I really want to nah, bring yeah, you back no, to talk to you about I want, I want this. I want this definitely to be like live too. So if, if there's a way that this, because I, I don't want it to be, I want people to be able to hear this live. Cause this, like, yeah, a lot of people took that way out of context, and like the people who were right. listening, like, could understand and realize. Cause just, I have a lot of black friends who, like, they understood exactly what I was talking about. But then you have those oh, yeah. ones who are immature and. Like taking everything out of context and oh, I need counseling and then what? Like counseling? Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah, I like um, it's, it's, I, I've had, I had conversations with people that that completely misunderstood what you said. I totally understood what you were saying. I got it. So that's why the next show will definitely be live. It's going to be live, and I want us to hit on that because I want people to be able to call in. And even talk about that. So, but what I want you to do before we go, I want you to leave everybody with one thing, one encouraging word, and then tell them how to connect with you. Brave, you know, mm-hmm. just be brave, you know, whatever. And that, and that's just not even the coming out aspect. Just, you know, that's just life in general. Like, be brave, mm-hmm. be yourself. Like, don't worry about. You know what yeah. people are gonna say about you? What people are gonna like? How they gonna feel? Like, do that. I always tell one of the things I always say. I don't care if you want to be an astronaut. Like, if that's what you want to do, do it. Don't worry about what that person is gonna say. You don't know. Like, you do you at the end of the day. As long as you love and enjoy doing what you're doing, that's all that matters. Like, and my social media is my Twitter is Flash, the number two, and Gordon. And my Instagram is it's Derek Gordon. Um, just send me, as I said, just send me a direct message. I'm always, as I said, I'm always constantly checking my messages. And, yeah, like I try to get to back to as many people as I can. And just as I said, because I know, like how we touched on earlier, we all know how it is, you know, not being able to have that person mm-hmm. to talk to. So I try to, you know, talk to as many people as I can. So those, I would say Instagram. Um, just send me a message. That's the best way to uh, get in contact with me. Awesome. Thank you again, Derek, for joining us tonight. Thank each and every one of you for listening. As I said, we will be getting Derek back to have part two of this. We want you guys to call in, ask your questions, leave your comments, all those great things. Make sure you connect with him on social media. And as I always say, create a great day. Walk with purpose and by all means, execute your vision. Peace.